with me in studio is co-author of Glenn Agliotti, A Biography, and it's welcome to Sean Newman, just to show you this book. It's got a really scary guy on the front page. He looks like uh, the guy from The Godfather, doesn't he? He does, doesn't he? I often say to him it's about the most gangster he's ever going to look. <laughs> mm, and, but he's a gangster. I mean, this is reading through this book, it, it left me with a feeling of huge disquiet. You guys have done a fantastic job. You've Thank got his you. cooperation. We have. Um, but if I was a policeman, I'd be to so embarrassed that here's a guy who talks about counterfeit cigarettes, he talks about his drug deals, and it's, it's all, they roll off the tongue so easily, yet this is crime in a big way. I don't think it rolled off so easy. I think the end product is, is one thing, but you know, you've got, kind of got to build that trust with somebody like Len. And he, he is one of those he wants to be liked. He's, he's, he's one of those lovable rogue type characters. Lovable rogue. <laughs> I, you know, I think personally, you know, it, 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 it does get to a point where sometimes you, you look at him and you think, are you actually capable of some of the things that you've been accused of? Because he puts through a very personable character and he's very charming. You like him. Uh, you say here uh, you've been a laugh a minute to be around. This is your, in your introduction to Glenn uh, Agliotti. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you. How can you like a guy who, that you've researched and you know he's, he's close to as, as evil as we're going to find in this country? Well, you know, let's be honest, I did work for Lolly Jackson. <laughs> we, we, let's, let, let's be honest about <laughs> so that. So it's a low base you're yeah, working from. Yeah, we, we, we don't really push hard. No, Glenn is a nice guy. You know what, I think he's, he, for, for all intents and purposes, I think he's a hustler more than anything else. I think he plays the game. Um, looking at things, I think there were over-promises and under-deliverables within the whole system in terms of, you know, the celebi access and things like that. I think, I think to, to a very vast degree, he likes to play the system, mm -hmm. but I don't think he's, he's very much as hands-on as everyone tends to expect him to be. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more a playing of the system. And I think, if anything, ultimately he got caught out by being in the middle of all of this and being somebody that they could kind of target with his undesirable dealings in, in illicit cigarettes and, and the like. He thinks he's a businessman. He says, uh, a hustler seems to carry a stigma, but all successful business people share the same trait. That's garbage. That's, 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 that's his what viewpoint. he thinks. That's his viewpoint. You know, the, the, this is the thing is, you're dealing with characters where it's their mindset. Mm. You're never going to change that mindset. I mean, yeah. it, it, there, there, there were times when Glenn would go, but I'm a nice guy. And eventually it got the point where we'd have to go, you're not. You're a convicted drug trafficker. We need to understand this. Rather admit to what you've done, people are more open to honesty mm. than they are to trying to sugarcoat things and I did nothing wrong. As far as it, uh, the Power Lunch audience is concerned, they, many watching today would have known, or if not known, admired Stephen Moldenhall, uh, the former Chief Investment Officer at Alan Gray, who was on radio with me one That's night, it. went home, and it, as he yeah. arrived home... He was shot. Three I mean, times. Yeah. The story, I mean, some of these stories made me go cold. I'd followed the trial, but you know, when you get your hands on these court transcripts and you start reading through them, and just the manner in which the, the killers themselves could just rattle off these affairs and Clinton Nassif and things, and, and just rattle it off as if it was nothing. And, and here I'm sitting and I'm thinking, you know, I've got a three-year-old daughter. The reason they didn't kill him, they just injured him, was because he had kids. But now you sit there and you look at it and you go, how do you just walk in because somebody is blocking an investment into a company. And Unless you've got a huge amount to hide. Well, I think or if you the, hate him. I like think he hated, uh, this is Brett Cable who yeah. was involved. And, and, and John Stratton. Uh, John Stratton, the Australian, who's still sitting in Australia, hasn't been extradited. Well, I mean, we, we, we attempted very far because with this book, we felt there were two voices that hadn't been heard before. And that was, you know, we've got the killer's voices. We've got Celebi. Uh, we felt Glenn and John needed to be explored. And let me tell you something. We hounded John. We, we pushed Skype, everything, and he, he's not talking. He's, I don't think he's ever going to talk. You do you remember the night Kebble was killed? There was a press release that came out, signed by John Stratton. Yeah. He was in the country, interestingly. Martin Welts, Noseweek, he was also on the hit list. Uh, so was Mark Wellesley Wood yeah. from DRD, uh, Mark Bristow, an old friend of mine, Jean Nautier. It seemed as if anybody crossed Kebble, Kebble would find somebody, um, Kebble and John Stratton, pay them a million bucks, as they did with yeah. Moldenhall, and... But this is the thing, is one has to question then, you know, we, we've got this underworld situation in South Africa where, where everyone looks at these gangster types and they go, oh no. I think the problem goes far deeper because it goes into the corporate side, as, 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 as the Kibble case proved. How ruthless is corporate South Africa that when somebody's tending to step on your toes, block a deal, or potentially unravel a, a load of rubbish that you've put together and theft and fraud and everything, 
how far are, are, are these corporate heads willing to push the boundary just because they're not physically pulling the trigger? The order and the money is coming from them, and I think it's actually more scary than, than we could ever imagine. Sean, sure, uh, there's a lot in here that scares me. Does it scare you? It does. I mean, as I said to you off camera, you know, the lolly book is kind of like in your face. It's, it's there. You know, we, we read about it, front page of the newspaper, it disappears. There's actual murder there. But these, some of these dealings are so covert and underhanded that you, for the fact that, I mean, Clinton Nassif sat across the table from Glenn a week before he got arrested for the Kibble murder and was smiling and my brother this and my brother that. This is what you're dealing with, is these individuals who can blatantly sit there and have a drink with you one day and the next day you're either dead, attempted to be murdered, or you've been arrested. The obvious question after all of this is why is this man still walking? Why is he still free? Well, I think, I think if we're completely honest, he did a deal in the Celebi case. Celebi was the fish they wanted to fry on that one. Kibble, I don't think he, he was ever meant to come down because if, if John Stratton, they say, the judge said it may have been a different situation had John Stratton testified, there were no overt attempts to make sure that Stratton, it's not like, um, like George Smith with, with Lolly where they're actually making an attempt to mm. bring him back into the Lots country. Lots of names. Uh,